Okay, so today, uh, or last class period, we talked about um, basically a brief culture or a brief, we got a brief history lesson on uh, where film has gone in the last 200 years. Today, we're actually going to jump into basically what makes film good and what type of videos there are because there's different video types. How you approach an audience um, is different depending on what type of video it is that you want them to, uh, to know and to go through. So my question for you guys to discuss with each other today really quickly, I want you guys to name and define the five types of video. So types of video. And just to kind of give you a quick heads up, I'll give you one of the types, um, just so that way you guys kind of know. One of the types of video is a music video. So that's a type of video. There's four other ones that are sort of like that. I want you to discuss with your group, and I'm going to come around, um, and then I'm going to um, um, ask um, um, whoever you guys appoint as the speaker for your group, what your group came up with, because I'm going to need four more, and we got uh, six groups in here, so I'll choose four of those six particular groups. Okay, cool. So you guys got about two minutes. Discuss with your group. All right, cool. So that gave us a little bit of time for you guys to kind of go through and take a look at it. Okay, um, we're going to start over here with group one. So you guys are group one. Who did you guys appoint as your particular group speaker? You guys have no one. Okay, cool. So we'll go with Ranson. Ranson, what did you guys come up with? Give me one. Just give me one type of video that you guys might have come up with. Say again, a movie. Okay, cool. Let's run with that. Let's write that down. By the way, you guys will see some stuff written down up here because I was going over stuff with some of my other classes. All right. So we're going to say one of these is a movie. So we already said music video is definitely one. Cool. Then we said movie is another type of video. Cool. So we'll go to group two. Group two, who was appointed as your group speaker? Cool. And that's Alex. Cool. So what do you got? A show. What, what kind of show? Just a show. Okay, cool. So we'll go with the show. Okay, so we're saying music video is different from a movie, which is different from a show. Okay, now we're going to skip group three. So you guys are good. We're going to go over here to group four. Ladies, what did you, who's going to be the person speaking for you? Okay, that's, okay, cool. Documentary, good. All right, and then we're going to go up here to group five. What did you guys come up with? Who's going to speak for you? Okay, an internet video, cool. Okay, so according to you guys in here so far, we would classify the five major types of video to be what you guys came up with, which are a music video, I already gave you one, a movie, okay, which actually, by the way, is one of them, so I'm going to start these next to it. It's actually under film, and we'll get to that here in a little bit. A show is close, 
to uh, close to another type of video. Really, what you're looking for is episodic formats or episodes or television. So I'll go ahead and give that to you guys there. Documentary is actually a type of movie. It's actually a genre movie, and we'll move into genres uh, during the second semester. So we'll kind of explain the difference between action versus documentary versus uh, rom-coms or just comedies and so on and so forth, and how you approach filming them. Um, so that was not one of them. That's good. That's good uh, guess for there. And the last one we said was internet. Internet actually is a medium. It's a distribution method. So it's a way that people send out different major types of video. So while that's not quite it, it is still in the same area. Um, it's, it's, again, the distribution method, which we talked about if you uh, go back and listen to the other lecture that we just had before. We talked about before how you can disseminate videos through disks. You can send, uh, disseminate them through the internet, or you can broadcast them and disseminate them through radio frequency and radio waves. So today what I want to do is kind of discuss these a little bit more, because we're missing two, but I also want to define these. And then as I'm defining these, I want to talk about how you can dis decide or distinguish the difference between good video and bad video. Because it's not necessarily about how you feel about a particular video, it's about how the video is that decides whether or not it's good or bad. Okay? So that's where we're going to jump into uh, more of the lecture portion of our, of our class uh, today. So <clears throat> here are the five major types of video. And again, it'll take us a little bit to kind of go through them one by one, but we will eventually get through them. So the five major types of video that we have, okay, and I'm going to give you examples of each one as we, uh, as we take a look at it. First one we have is news. News is a, is a major type of video. You can classify a bunch of different videos in this particular category, okay. Another uh, major type of video is infomercials. Not commercials, not information videos, but infomercials. Videos that advertise certain or specific things and they give you information about another particular product or uh, another individual. Okay? Next type of video you have is a music video, which we talked about, and we'll go in through and define what a music video is because it's changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, it used to be uh, um, done a very specific way back in the 70s and 80s, um, but once the 2000s kind of rolled around and Apple kind of changed the way we disseminated music, Music videos have kind of changed in the way that you approach them. Um, and then the last two, television series, which are episodic formats, or episodic videos, um, that, that don't necessarily have an end, but they have different episodes that kind of make up a series. And the last, that we have, uh, the last thing that we have is a, is a film, or a short film. So I wanted to discuss each one of these uh, going through. First one that we'll talk about, of course, is news. And I'm going to give you an example video of each one. So here's where, uh, where we get the, a news major type of video. This is how you can tell if a video is news or not. News is the communication of information to a mass audience. So if you were to take something that you want to say and push it to someone else, and that's your end goal, is to just take that information and to disseminate that out to a bunch of people, that's news. Okay? There's nothing major or fancy about it. It's just, here's information. We're going to send it this direction comes from the Latin word nova. Nova actually means new happenings, so it's things that are happening currently that you're disseminating to other individuals. Sports falls under the news category. Okay, and I'll kind of explain that. It's actually pretty simple. When you're watching a sporting event, let's say a football game, all you have to do is, all you have to realize what you're doing is sitting back and you're watching a play or, or information or new happenings develop. The cameras and the broadcasters and the individuals that are discussing what is currently happening on the field, the reporters, the athletes, and so on and so forth, are constantly giving you new information about the ongoings that are currently happening in that particular world. Okay? Social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all fall under the news category as well. Typically, if you were to make a video to send out, even a vlog type video, something like on YouTube for the most part, if you're disseminating information, if you're saying, hey guys, How's it going? What's up? I'm going to talk to you about this particular thing. That's disseminating news and information. You're not trying to make it, uh, you're not trying to make it an episodic series. You're not trying to do a cool little short film and so on and so forth. You're just trying to communicate information. Now you'll notice that the word news actually has nothing to do with truth. And so that's something that's been very interesting for people to watch in the last eight to ten years. Is with the rise of social media, you've had a rise in fake news. Well, you can't really necessarily have fake news because it's how things are being perceived by the individual that, is, that it's currently happening to. Okay? 
Remember the example that I used before about an individual, if, if, a, if a guy and a girl are sitting down, a guy sees a female walk by or whatever, he, in his mind he's just looking at her and saying, oh cool, she looks cute, okay whatever, and then turns back to another girl. If, if that girl sees him looking at her and thinks that that girl is cuter than she is and it threatens the relationship, she has a completely different perspective than he does. Which one's true, which one's false? And the answer is they're both true to those individuals at that particular time. Now the question is, is how are you going to communicate that information across? Why are you going to communicate that information across? What is the point that you're trying to communicate in that particular, in that particular way, that information? That's what news is trying to do. News is trying to communicate information accordingly. Now it's up to the receiver, the person, that, the recipient on their end, to distinguish whether or not it's true or not. So there's a lot of talk in today's world about news media and how things are kind of crumbling down and kind of going away and you have this huge rise in new media. Okay, really? Um, but it's, it's not really about rising information and different news. It's the way that it's being set up to be explained to individuals and it's the way that they're receiving it on their particular end. So for example, if I really wanted to find out the worst possible things about this school, I could tell you the worst possible things about this school to make you not want to come here. Conversely, I can talk to you about the best possible things that can happen at this particular school. That would make you definitely want to come here. So I'll give you a great example. When I first searched up coming to this school three years ago, I literally typed in Vista Murrieta High School into YouTube. What do you think the first video was that popped up in my search? A fight? Okay, cool. Anyone else? Athletics? Cool. Yep. Athletics? Cool. It was actually almost both, um, but here, here's what, what it was that popped up. Uh, typed in Vista Marietta High School, hit enter. Uh, five students charged with rape at Vista Marietta High School uh, for a locker room incident. Apparently there was something that happened back in 2012. There were a bunch of football players that got together and apparently went after a specific female and took turns on her. And that's the first thing that popped up on YouTube in regards to this particular school. Right? Can you see how that would change my perception and understanding of this particular school? Like if you wanted to, you can literally pop on YouTube right now and just type in Vista Marietta High School. And that would probably be still one of the first news stories that pops up. Okay, not a good way to start out. Now once I actually got here, and the, when I started talking to the people that were in charge, what do you think the first thing it was that they said about this particular school? How do you think they highlighted it? You see it out there on the statue every day. Say it again. OKB, okay, yeah, America's most spirited high school. Really weird, two different dichotomies. Rape, America's most spirited high school. I mean, you want to talk about two different extremes, which one's right, which one's accurate? They're both right. They're both accurate, they're both truth. But the way the recipient, in this case me, interprets it changes the way that you kind of appear, or how it appears to that particular individual. Right? So eventually, once you start actually digging things up and finding out more information, you realize that there's certain incidents and you have to take all the incidents into balance and then you have to weigh them and then come up with an opinion about what it is that you're taking a look at. Now, for example, if you're going to be covering something, you're going to try and communicate information to a mass audience and you want to get them engaged, the best way to get them engaged is to make them fight. Okay, so you'll notice that on Twitter, if you want your Twitter followers or your Instagram followers or something else to kind of go up, typically you'll talk about things where it gets individuals to fight one another. Because if you fight one another, people are going to be more engaged. And when they're not physically in the same presence of each other, you don't have to worry about getting hurt, right? The worst thing that can happen is someone gets doxxed, ooh, right? Most of the stuff that people write on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, they would not actually say to that person in real life. Because if they did, they know there would be a physical altercation that broke out and all of a sudden their very survival actually could depend on the fact that, oh shoot, I don't actually know how to defend myself. I'm just saying things. It's much easier to put a barrier or a screen in between what I'm saying and, what, and, and the reaction that other individuals have. So when it comes to news, when you're creating that for videos, if you want engagement, you want to talk about things that are more controversial. Okay. This is what BuzzFeed tries to do. This is what the New York Times tries to do. This is what the Washington Post tries to do. They don't necessarily care about what's true and what's not true. That's, that's a great marker to put up on your banner and your masthead. But what you're really trying to do is make sure you have a job and you can ha cover the next story the next day. And how you cover that story di differs and depends on what your audience wants. So your audience will tell you how they want to cover stories. So let me show you what a real actual news story looks like, okay, before I get into infomercials. 
okay? Here's an example of a news story, okay? Where we're just communicating information to people. We'll see if stocks can end this. Or, or, take two, let's try this again, because for some reason I still have that off. We'll see if stocks can end this shortened trading week in record territory yet again. Yesterday, the Dow finished 20 points higher, just shy of the 17,000 mark, a psychologically important milestone. The Nasdaq finished flat. All eyes will be on the government's jobs report for June. It comes out this morning, and economists are expecting another solid month of hiring. Yesterday, payroll processor ADP reported a huge jump in private sector jobs for June. Target is asking customers to leave their guns at home. The company says walking into Target with a gun creates an environment at odds with its family-friendly shopping and work experience. A spokesperson says this is a request and not a prohibition. The retailer does not sell guns. And a Reading Rainbow Kickstarter campaign has brought in more than $5 million from 105,000 different backers. That makes it the most However, widely backed campaign in Kickstarter's history. The show's host, actor LeVar Burton, raised money for an online version of the children's show. He promised it will be available on Xbox, PlayStation, and streaming devices like Apple TV, plus 7,500 classrooms for free. And that is your CBS Money Watch report. For more, follow me on Twitter at Jill Wagner CBS. At the New York Stock Exchange, I'm Jill Wagner. Very simple, very straightforward, okay? Communicating information to a mass audience, okay? Now, there's a bunch of different ways that can be interpreted by the audience. People can look at the Target thing and go, oh, Target's anti-Second Amendment. That's how they could frame that. They can frame it that way and then write opinion pieces and go down the line. But all they're trying to do is communicate information to you. They're not trying to give you opinions, okay? <laughs> just want to make sure you know the, uh, just make sure you know the facts, right? <clears throat> That's what news is supposed to be. It's supposed to communicate information. Now, what people typically tend to do with it is they try and take it, fit their own narrative, and then, and then change it to kind of go down the path that they want to go down, okay? And there's different opinion shows. You'll see opinion shows, for example, on cable news networks. So you get like Fox, CNN, and MSNBC, where you'll get opinions on things that are happening throughout the day. And then people will decide, okay, yes, I think I agree with this person's opinion. So I want to hear the news from them, because apparently I like their perspective as opposed to hearing this perspective, okay? The whole, goal, the whole goal, though, of actual news videos is just to communicate information. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Next one we have <coughs> infomercials. Here's what infomercials do. Infomercials have kind of changed. Um, this definition needs updating. It's still not fully um, accurate to what it is today. But infomercials are a span of television programming that are produced and paid for by an organization to convey a message about a product. So now we're not just communicating information, facts, figures, and so on and so forth with our particular videos. This time through, we want to convey information or a message about a product. Okay, it's great. Love the hammering. <coughs> okay, and the whole point of us communicating this information about this product is because we want people to buy into it. Okay, people buy into this particular product, make cash money, good, that's the whole point of our video. So we're not going to communicate the bad information to them, we're only going to communicate the good information to them. And so that's what infomercials are doing, okay? Infomercials give information about a product or a service that is currently being offered, and again, it wants to show it in the best light possible. The reason why you want to show it in the best light possible, get the money, okay? The way we uh, get the word infomercial is by combining two English words, information and then commercial. So we're advertising while also giving the information. Seems like I'm repeating myself, probably am, but trying to basically hammer home that the whole point of an infomercial is for you, is, is for you to make sure that people buy into, positively buy into that particular product, okay? Movie trailers are infomercials. They're not going to show you the sad, bad parts of the film unless it's going to get you to come in to go watch the film. They're only going to show you the best and most amazing parts. So by its very nature, movie trailers should be uplifting. They should make you want to take action. Okay? Most people take a look at movie trailers and think, ah, it's just a, a shortcut of the film. Yes, you could get a lot of the, the information about the film from the movie trailer, but the whole point of the movie trailer is to get you into the theaters. So if they give you the entire film in the trailer, there's no point for you to actually go watch the film. So 
Movie trailers today actually aren't really good anymore. They used to be really good because they used to make you ask a question, do I want to go see this film and do I want to find out more about this story? Uh, nowadays, typically what they'll do is they'll give you a quick little snippet of what happens in the film. And then once you know what happens in the film, you'll kind of decide whether or not you want to go see it. Okay. Christopher Nolan is really good with his uh, movie, movie trailers because he tries to keep it mysterious. Gives you just enough information to make you decide, do I want to spend 10 or $12 on this? And he hopes that his name makes you want to go into the, uh, into the theater because who doesn't want to go see a, the latest Christopher Nolan film, right? Also makes, uh, makes him as a director and a writer have to do better and have to perform well each time. Okay, it's harder to do it that way. If you're Michael Bay and you're just known for explosions, all you have to do is show explosions up on the screen and then you'll get 14 to 16 year old males to want to come into the theater to watch the film, irregardless of what's happening in the story. Okay, that's typically his target audience that he goes for. Um, by the way, Michael Bay, actually most of his films are infomercials and commercials. You mostly see products advertised throughout all of his films. That's the reason why he's able to make tons of explosions because he's advertising, he's blowing up stuff right in front of a Pepsi truck or in front of a, a, a Mountain Dew truck, or in front of a Vio, Sony Vio laptop. Like, it's, it's all about product placement for his stuff. Okay, let me show you what an infomercial looks like. We're gonna go back old school for this one. Here we go. Hi, Billy Mays here for the Big City Slider Station. The fast and easy way to press and cook delicious sliders. Those restaurant mini burgers everyone loves. No more squishing and squashing or flipping and flopping. With the slider station, just scoop, press, and cook right on your stove. The unique design cooks both sides at once, so you never have to flip them. And in just two minutes, you'll have five mouth-watering sliders. Use dinner rolls, potato rolls, any bun. You can double or triple stack them and watch your family attack them. Top with pickles, onions, ketchup or cheese, big city sliders are sure to please. The double-sided non-stick surface is so slick, not even burnt on cheese will stick. Whether it's ground beef, chuck or sirloin, just scoop, press and cook. No flipping and no hassle. Make healthy turkey, chicken and veggie burgers with ease and join the craze with me, Billy Mays. You can also cook them on a bed of onions for that classic diner taste. Or use the slider station as the ultimate burger press to load the grill in no time. And watch this. On a busy school morning, five perfect egg sandwiches in an instant. Moms, you're going to love it. And when you're done, clean up the breeze. Call now and receive the Big City Slider Station with measuring scoop for just $19.99. We'll also include the Slider Station recipe guide loaded with my favorite creations like the barbecue bacon cheddar and the original Billy Burger free. But call right now and we'll send you the quick prep slicer. Perfect for onions, pickles, and mushrooms. A $20 value free. Just pay separate shipping and handling. You get it all. Big City Slider Station, measuring scoop, recipe guide, and quick prep slicer. All for just $19.99. Order right now. Every time I show this commercial, everyone's like, Snipe, I hate you because now I'm hungry. And if you're hungry, cool, awesome, they did their job, <laughs> right? Hungry, hung, hungry, hopefully, for burgers and little mini burgers, right? Okay. By the way, you notice how loud it is right off the bat? That wasn't just an error in, in my judgment trying to make sure that, that it's really, that needs to be turned down. Most infomercials are like that, okay, especially the ones you see on TV. They will specifically be louder. There was actually a, a federal law that was written down that said they couldn't be as loud as they were, but they're typically louder on purpose because they want to try and capture your attention because they know you're not watching the commercials. Okay, so they're like, oh, I'm going to come right in and burst into your house like the freaking Kool-Aid man and announce that I'm here and here's what I'm here to sell you. Okay, these little burgers and these bur this burger flipper, right? Okay, so those are infomercials. Next one we'll go through. Okay, music videos. Then we'll actually take a look at a music video. One of my, one of my uh, early, early understandings uh, when it came to film. One of the best ones I could understand. Uh, music videos. Music videos are actually short videos. They're not supposed to be long. And they're supposed to be accompanied by a piece of music or a song that represent an artistic visual experience of a given musical piece. The video portion is supposed to be the visual representation of what the artist is discussing in the lyrics or what the music is trying to convey in its tempo and in its sound. <clears throat> 
if we're not getting that visual experience up on the screen, then we're not paying uh, right or proper tribute to the poet or to the lyricist who ended up coming up with the song. Now today it's a little bit different. Today it's a little bit different because um, most of the music that you listen to um, is very, very, very simplistic in the way that it comes across in order to appeal to the largest audience. Okay? I'm going to throw my hands up. They're playing our song and so on and something, something. And, but I know there's a party in the USA. Okay, Miley Cyrus right there. It's very, very, very simplistic. It literally tells you what to do. There's a couple of songs. Clap, 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 clap your hands, right? Clap, 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 clap your hands. Very, very simplistic. Didn't used to be that way. Songs used to be a lot more complex back in the 60s, 70s, and slowly into the 80s. But once you hit around the 90 time period, um, in order, if you want to gain a larger audience, people found out you had to be simpler in your understanding and the simpler in your vibes and your beats, okay? Which is why Usher's Yeah song is literally, yeah, shorty got down and so on and so forth, but you just hear a bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum. It's that repeated over and over and over again because it's very simplistic, it gets stuck in your head, it becomes an earworm, okay? Exactly, right? Here's what the original uh, word music actually means. Music actually comes from the Greek word musa, which means to give an offering of feeling or poetry. Okay, there is a huge difference between rap and hip hop. Does anyone know the difference between rap and hip hop? They're not the same. Yeah, exactly. Really? Come on, man. I don't want to be educating you guys. You guys should know this stuff. <laughs> okay, rap. Rap is an acronym, which stands for. Clo you're close. Man, there's people in here that listen to Kendrick all the time and don't know what rap means. Okay, rap, rap stands for rhythm and poetry. Rhythm, poetry. There's a reason why, actually, I think it was Kendrick that won the, the a poet, who, uh, poet award, award for his poetry because of his raps. Okay, you're supposed to be discussing something of importance while speaking in timed rhythm about something that's currently, uh, that's currently happening. Okay. Nowadays, hip hop is supposed to make your hips hop, right? It's supposed to be a dance song, dance and music. What happened was in the early 2000s, these started to blend together. When you got like G Unit, 50 Cent, who was part of G Unit, um, you got the game, and you got a couple of other guys that were coming around. They kind of started to blend hip hop and rap together. Okay, before you used to have someone like uh, like Tupac, uh, Too Short. Of course, Biggie, everyone talks about those two, and so on and so forth. Um, no one really talks about Sol uh, Sister Soldier. Soldier Sister? Sister Soldier. In the early 90s. Anyone know her and what she ended up doing and putting together? She had a huge political background where she was really trying to not only fight the power um, with stuff, but she was a huge supporter of Bill Clinton and then getting him elected back in the 90s. And when utilized her music to help spread and convey that message because she's trying to offer up a feeling or trying to give it uh, that feeling through poetry and trying to get people in urban communities to get out and vote specifically for this individual, this new guy, the guy who will be the first true black president, Mr. Bill Clinton. Okay, yeah, that's one of the things that he was known by in the early 90s. One of the ways he got one of the ways he got elected because he was so kind and good to the urban communities. Okay, that's what music is supposed to do. It's supposed to get you out and get you vibing off whatever it is that you need to vibe off of. Yesterday, I actually opened up a Spotify playlist for myself, and I literally typed in esoteric pop and had some of the best music I've listened to in a while. Most people in here are like, I can't even spell the word esoteric, much less tell you what it means. Okay? Um, there's a lot of different music that you can find if you're looking for specific feelings and you're looking for specific uh, poetry. Okay? So um, let me give you an example of a music video. Um, this music video is called The Way I Feel. It's by a group called 12 Stones. It was produced back in the mid-2000s, I want to say. It looks like it's the 90s. But it tells a very simplistic story that pretty much everyone in this room can and should be able to relate to. Okay? It talks about how he hates the way he feels inside. Okay? Should be pretty simplistic. Oh, man. 
Nothing like Panic at the Disco or some other stuff like that. This is more like emo with soul. Okay. Yeah, a little emo. Exactly. Um, it's talking. Whoops. Try that again. It's talking specifically. There we go. Um, about how people hate the way they feel inside and how no matter what they did, where this guy went, he would get picked on by dudes at school. And then he would go home to a parent or to a dad who didn't care and to a mom who was too busy off in her own world talking to her friends. Okay. A girl on the other end has a boy uh, and a boyfriend, I should say, who's trying to take advantage of her. And then when she goes home to try and talk to her parents about it, she can't talk to them about it because they're too busy arguing with each other because they don't like each other. So, and then not only that, they end up taking it out on her, right? That is definitely talking about a feeling that all of us could have experienced. And we're feeling that emotion through the music and we're seeing it displayed up here on the screen. So when you used to go and watch T MTV all the time, I want my, I want my, I want my MTV, back in the 90s and early 2000s, before it became what it is today, music videos were meant to visually depict what was happening in the lyrics. Okay, if you were to try to do that with Eminem's Superman, if you don't know what that is, if you guys know what that song is, yeah, uh, that's a little bit of a different story, okay? Mr. Mathers actually said specifically that if we don't visually depict what I am talking about in my song, um, I walk. I'm going away from this record label. MTV says, we can't show it. He says, I don't care. He goes, you do know, or MTV says, you do know this song is about strippers and like bearing breasts and like all a ton of other porn and stripper stuff, right? He's like, yeah, dude, I wrote the lyrics. And he's like, yeah, I want to visually depict that up on screen. Okay, 50 Cent with Candy Shop. I want to take her to the candy shop. And so on. you guys can finish the lyrics from there. Can't really depict what that actually is implying because it's a double entendre. Not only would you not get it shown anywhere on TV, YouTube would probably ban it. Because it's using women as objects to get sexual gratification in, much, in, mu in many ways that today are, are, are widely repudiated. So you actually just have a good looking chick dancing in a candy shop. Right? He backed down a little bit, and that's kind of what started people to move away from um, really depicting their, their uh, the, visually depicting their lyrics. But, it, but go back and look at some of the lyrics of the songs that you listen to, and you'll realize, hey, one of the reasons why you're listening to those is either A, you're in that situation, or B, you're putting yourself in that situation and trying to find a way out by listening to lyrics and repeating things over and over and over and over again. Okay. I like to say that there's three types of people that go to clubs, because I was one of them. You have the depressed, the deprived, and the depraved. Depressed people, because they can't get things working in their life, so they're going to go to a club and either drink their problems, smoke their problems, or do drugs uh, and, get, and relieve their problems chemically in some sort of way. Okay. Then you have uh, the deprived people. These are people that can't get in a relationship or stay in one properly, so they go there for hookups with other individuals and stuff, or just go there to dance because they just need to let loose. And then you have the depraved. Those are the crazy people who actually go there specifically to have evil doings because they know that the first two kinds of people are actually going there. And so it's much easier to prey on people that are already down in the dumps when they're already there. Okay? So <clears throat> that's a lot of, uh, of, of what music actually does. Music has a chance, has a way to, not a chance, it does, change the soul um, and changes the way that you interpret the world around you. Okay? So knowing how to approach that particular video is important because you might be able to utilize that in some way, shape, or form, right? Television. Television isn't just this box that you have inside of your house with this screen that you can kind of hook up to and watch NBC, CBS, ABC, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, television is a little bit different now. We have a lot of television actually online. 
through online services, not just through Netflix, but through Hulu, Disney Plus coming out here pretty soon, um, a lot of different, different streaming services. Here's what television is. Television is a broadcast medium, so that means it's a medium that sends information out to a bunch of people okay, from a singular source. So it's not trying to convey a message per se, it's trying to push information out to people. Um, but it's used for short form videos that usually have episodes that comprise a series, which is why you guys said a series earlier or a show. Okay. Um, what you do typically with television is you have a story that you want to tell, you know where you're going to start. You don't necessarily know where you're going to end. But you want to keep exploring this idea more than just one time through. You want to keep exploring this idea week after week, day after day, maybe hour after hour. Could be an opinion show, could be a vlog, could be something like that. But typically, if it's episodic in nature where you're having to do a series of these things, it's considered to be television or a television type of video. So the word television comes from two, uh, two, uh, two words, one of them Greek, one of them Latin. The Greek word is telos, which means far, so it's something that's far away. So we get a word for telescope. Okay, telos means far, scope means close, bring something far away, very close. Okay, and the Latin word visio, that's where actually, by the way, the TV designer got their name. They just swapped out the S for the Z. Um, visio, which actually means sight. So television is bringing something that is produced or done far away, close to home, in order for individuals to engage in it individually. It's not meant for group viewings, it's meant for individual viewings. Okay. So nowadays we have what's called IPTV, which is Internet Protocol Television. It's television series that are sent through the Internet. Okay? Um, and because it's sent through the Internet, it, you don't have to go watch it at a very specific time. We talked about before how broadcasters um, used, to be, used to send out information to a bunch of different people. People couldn't pick and choose when a broadcaster put something on. Okay? They had to wait for the broadcaster to decide when they were going to put stuff up. So if you wanted to watch Seinfeld, you had to wait till 9 o'clock every Tuesday or Wednesday night, whenever it was that was on. I just remember it was 9 o'clock. Okay. Um, if you want to watch 24, you had to wait till Mondays at 9 o'clock. Same thing. Lost, 8 o'clock, Wednesdays on ABC. Uh, nowadays, you're just like, okay, what's the title of the show? I'll go see if I have the thing. And then I can watch it whenever you want to watch it. So because you have time shifting capabilities, you can release a season all at once. This is what Netflix start, did starting with House of Cards back in 2012. Yeah, 2012. It was an experiment by Netflix. They wanted to do something different. They're like, let's not just release it week after week. We have the entire sh series done. Let's just release it all at once and see what people do. And so that's why Netflix shows now are released in seasons. They're not released week by week. HBO still releases their stuff week by week. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what television is. Even if you're watching a streamer okay, on Twitch, um, they are doing television. They are having episodic programming where it's like this today they're going to play No Man's Sky. And this week they're going to play Borderlands 3 and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, they have a schedule set up for when they're going to broadcast and what they're going to be broadcasting and sending out to different people. Okay? So that's what television is. Now what's really cool is if you have a story that you want to tell, you can tell a really cool very, very long story. Television is a writer's medium more so than it is a, a cinema, cinemagraphic um, or a cinematographer's medium or a director's medium. Because you can write this episode, which then leads then to this episode, which then leads into this episode. This is how you get things like Breaking Bad. Um, this is how you get things like Friends or Seinfeld. The episodes don't necessarily need to connect, other than um, that they're, they're telling a specific story involving those characters again. And it's telling that story specifically so we can find out more and discover more about ourselves as a result of that particular story. So typically you will see in a television series, even something like Family Guy or South Park, okay, you'll see it go a particular direction and somehow it always has a moral that links it back through with where they went through. And they talk about that moral at the end and how we can grow as people as a result of it. Okay? So like Tom Cruise being trapped in a closet, okay? it's, it's about being okay with just being yourself. Why don't you just come out? One of those type of things. Okay. Um, they make fun of him a whole lot by saying that he's trapped in the closet. He doesn't realize he's in the closet. They make fun of it the entire time. But the whole goal of it is to say, hey, like if you're feeling this way, dude, just be you. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Whether or not that's right is another story, but that's what they're trying to convey. That's the moral they're trying to convey with that particular episode. Okay. So let's take a look at a television series. I'm going to pop in. We're going to take a look at Seinfeld really quick and see how that works.
speaking of having it all. Where were you? I went to the beach. Oh, the beach. It's not working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. <laughs> I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Hey. Over there. It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Everyone. Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. <laughs> I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. <laughs> Untoasted with a side of potato salad and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria, hi. <laughs> There's a lesson in there for you guys. If you're used to uh, not going up to uh, women and asking them out, try something different. Do the opposite. See what happens, right? And girls, if you're used to strange guys coming up to you and asking you out, still do the same thing. Just turn them down. Um, that's usually what I like to try and tell people afterwards because it's, it's really funny how you can actually learn a moral from, that something, from something so dumb, something so stupid that this guy like, can't get his life together. And yet, we can learn how to make our lives better as a result. Um, it's really, it's really cool that, that television series do that. And they speak to us on different levels for different reasons about different things. Okay? Um, Netflix actually knows this really, really well. So they actually develop series based on what it is that you already watch. So they go, oh, there's a bunch of people that like to watch things like 24 and, uh, and Breaking Bad and so on and so forth. Let's create a television show. Let's call it Narcos. And so they create a show that's a lot like 24 and Breaking Bad. Um, and they'll do the same thing with, uh, with um, cartoons as well. It's, hey, look, I see a lot of people watching Powerpuff Girls. I see a lot of guys, older guys, really kind of into cartoons. They're missing stuff from like the 1990s and stuff. Let's create uh, um, Love, Death, and Robots. Let's see, let's see if that'll work. And of course, that becomes a big thing that blows up on, on Netflix. So knowing what taps into people's souls, okay, what talks to and speaks to people, really is important when we're developing our videos. It's not just, hey, I'm going to pull out my phone all of a sudden and start to create a little TikTok. That is part of it, but that's not all of it. So when it comes to film, film is something that is a little bit different. Okay? Film is a story that's conveyed with moving images, quote, like we, did, like we talked about before. And its goal is to spread a message to a wide audience, with a vi but the story has a very distinct beginning, middle, and end. So films are not supposed to be episodic in nature. They are not supposed to have sequels. Because if you have a sequel, well, then you're really just writing a television show, a television show, a television series. And if you're just really writing a television series, 
then why not put it on TV? Okay. And we'll talk about here in a second the Marvel Cinematic Universe and where this drops in. But the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a television show. It just happens to be shown in theaters. Okay, and then so we'll, we'll get into that as we continue to move on. Um, but films, uh, film comes from the French word filmin, and it's that long, thin membrane strip um, that, that images used to be printed out on. Okay, so they just named the medium after the thing that it used in order for, to project that particular medium. Okay. Um, that's what film actually does. Film is just supposed to be nothing more than a visual short story. You go in, you sit down for two hours, you, see, you, you meet these characters, or actually you, you get acquainted with this universe, you meet these particular characters, you watch some weird stuff happen to them, all of a sudden they get caught up in this other event that we didn't even know about necessarily. We go and watch them go through that particular event, building up to a climax, then there's a resolution, we learn something as a result of it, and then we go home. And then we can sit back and keep thinking about what occurred in there and how it relates to us in our lives and so on and so forth. That's what you're supposed to be doing when you go into the movie theaters. Things have kind of changed nowadays in the last 20 years. Okay? Pre-2000, pre-2001, that's really how it was. It was very easy to get people into the movie theaters. But again, we talked about how people kept on wanting to take these stories home. And so the only way to get people into theaters was to build bigger, broader stories with bigger, crazier sound, special effects, lighting, and so on and so forth. And eventually, you just go to the movie theaters to watch these massive animated experiences. Okay, very heavy in VFX. People don't want to go watch the story of individuals struggle with race down in the South. Okay, where you have a black officer who, get, who gets called uh, a myriad of names because he helps out a white family and feels like it's being betraying his particular tribe. Okay, I think that's three billboards to Mississippi. That's what it's called. Three, or it's just called Three Billboards. Something like that. It was an Oscar narrative. Or an Oscar nominee, I should say. Um, most people don't want to go and see those type of films in theaters anymore. Because they want to go and know that they're spending their money on something that's going to be big, grand, and a huge experience. They want to see the eye candy because they actually want to escape from the world. Not go and escape into a world where they might learn something and be able to apply it back to the real world. That's the big danger that we're kind of in right now. Actually, when it comes to a lot of a lot of stuff when it comes to television and film and so on and so forth. So filmmaking really is all about storytelling. How can you tell a much better story in a short amount of time, two to three hours? And what can that story help you do? For something like Interstellar, done by Chris Nolan, can you take a, a huge, gigantic universe of a story, apply real science to it, change the way visual effects actually are done, and talk about a love that a father has for his daughter? That's exactly what the film talks about and what the film actually does. It, it, it was his, actually the, the nickname for the film was called Flora's Letter. It was his love letter to his kids about how no matter how big the universe is and no matter how far away he is, the thing that transcends time is his love for them. Now he's going to show you really cool big black holes, really cool spacey stuff. People are going to like dematerialize. You're going to see people flying through, uh, through space and stuff like that. There's going to be terror and all that other stuff. But really, when you boil it down, it's, it's that meaning. Okay? Marvel Cinematic Universe is a little bit different. You have Iron Man start as like an episode one. And then you add in an episode two with something like The Incredible Hulk or Thor. And then you kind of follow that up with an episode three and a four, like Iron Man 2 and so on and so forth. And you can take what's done in comics and translate that to the, to the filmic universe. Well, if you're trying to do these big special effects with big sound, big visuals, and so on and so forth, People aren't going to pay to watch it on TV because that's really expensive to watch it on TV. So instead, let's just put it in the movie theaters and have people pay for each episode. Pay $10, 12 $15 to keep go going back and watching these episodes over and over and over again. If you actually think about it, if you went and saw every single film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the theaters and you paid $15 for each ticket, you would have spent almost $350 watching that series just to go watch it in the movie theaters. Most people would not pay that per month or total to, to bring the entire series home. Because there's 22 films, $15, $15 per film, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's how the Marvel Cinematic Universe translated to the movie screen. That's the reason why DC can't do it. DC isn't thinking television shows. They're trying to create trilogies and other stuff like that. They're not looking at what Marvel did where they're like, hey, look at all these comics. Let's have a couple of crossovers. Let's, oh, look at television. Oh, we can put it on television, but let's just use bigger special effects to get people in theaters. Okay. The reason why people loved Endgame so much 
was because of I Love You 3000. That talked to them because then they realized, once they heard those, those words, I Love You 3000, they realized, oh crap, this is a story about a guy becoming a dad. And then if you go back and look at Guardians of the Galaxy, it's about a kid in a relationship with a father he never had. And if you go back and look at Iron Man, it's Iron Man's relationship with the dad that he never had. And if you go back and look at Thor, you realize, oh goodness, that film's about Thor and Odin and Loki fighting over, uh, fighting over the relationship with each other. Loki and Thor are really trying to do the best for their dad. Like, the entire series is all about kids and dads. And once you start to realize that, and all of a sudden those other 20 other videos start making sense, when you get towards the end, you can't help but almost want to cry. Because you realize, oh shoot, how's my relationship with my dad? Because now that you know that all those films are related and talking about dads, you can see where you fit into them. And now that they're done telling that particular side of the story, by the way, Thanos and Gamora, father, daughter, it's all in there. Um, if you're done telling that particular story, where do you go from there? And so that's the reason why eventually you're like, well, we can't really do anything with these characters anymore. Let's have them start going, and let's introduce new characters and go in a new direction with a new story. And so that's what Phase 4 is about with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's the reason why they close the Infinity Saga and open up a new one, because they're done with that story. Season 1 is over. We're now going to go to Season 2. Can we try and flip it and do it again? So that's what films actually do. Now there's a difference between uh, film and television, and I really kind of want to narrow this down um, a little bit. There's three phases in both, so um, the, there's, there's different processes that happen in each phase, in pre-production, production, and post-production. Um, and I, I'm going to put those up here on the screen for you to take a look at. Um, here's the differences between those two. So for a film, there's many months of pre-production. They spend 9 to 12 months just in pre-production because they have to get the shot right. If you're going to build a bunch of VFX, people have to do things exactly as you plan them out to. So that way when the artists draw out and do the special effects, the special effects match up with, the, with what the person's doing in real life. Okay? So film, you have plenty of pre-production. Then you have a very strict beginning, middle, and end. And then you have many months of post-production to finish up the shots to make sure all the shots match. Okay? In a typical two-hour film, you have anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 shots. The camera will change 2,000 to 2,500 times in two hours. Basically 1,000 times an hour. Uh, if you break it down, it's something like, uh, like 40 times or 30 times. Sorry, it's like 35 times every minute. So one, it's every two seconds or so, the shot will change for the next two hours to kind of keep you busy, keep you entertained. That's how films work. Television is a little bit different. Television only has three weeks of pre-production for each episode. Because if you're going to do 10 episodes, there's only 52 weeks in a year. The most you can have is three to five weeks for each pre-production for each episode, if you're going to do 10 episodes. If there's 20 episodes in a series, you have less. Less time to really write it and make sure it's good. Okay? They have a strict beginning, but they have an open middle and an open end because they're open to changing things depending on where their characters want to go and what they want to do. Okay? And then conversely, if you want to get those episodes out, you only have three to six weeks of post-production as well for each of those episodes. Okay? So something like Stranger Things, we all want another Stranger Things episode, right? Well, the problem is, is that if we have another strain, or if we, if we have more than eight, they're now spending less than six weeks on each one. Six weeks is on the larger end, so they're spending a lot of time to, to do those particular episodes, but they're turning them out as fast as they can. Sometimes they can't turn them out fast enough. Okay, because there's a lot of special effects, which take time to render. People have to think up, then you have to actually draw it out, then you have to map out what that thing's going to actually do, then you have to make it actually work and do that thing in the computer. Then you have to tell the human, here's what the thing in the computer is going to do, but you can't see that yet, so you need to go do this. The human has to try and match it. The director has to go, okay, I think the human and the computer did the same thing, almost. Let's go see how it matches up later on. They wait a couple more weeks, see how things match up. Ah, oh, shoot, we messed it up. Got to go back and reshoot stuff, bring it back over ratchet them all back up. Cool, now we got to run passes for coloring, for uh, any other visual effects, and boom, then we got our one shot. <laughs> then we have to go do that for another bunch of shots. Like, it takes time in order to be able to, to put this stuff together. You want better quality, you're going to get less of it. Okay? It's like the VHS Betamax thing. Betamax, really good quality, but only holds two hours. VHS, you get six hours, but you get really crappy quality. Okay? So that's the difference between film and television. Film, you can extend that out. Television, you've got to really uh, be succinct in what it is that you're presenting. Okay? So normally, this is where we would take a break um, to kind of spread things out, but we're going a little bit behind. It is getting really hot in here, though, isn't it? Man, I know. I'm trying to find a way that we can 
you know, hopefully get stuff going a little bit more. Um, if you need to take a break at all, uh, if you need to take the pass or whatever, you can go grab, go use the restroom and stuff. But I'm going to try and keep pushing forward so we can get to the next part of this and kind of get through uh, the rest of our lecture. Um, the next part that I was originally going to have you guys talk about, and I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to discuss this so we have a little bit of a break um, in, in what we're doing, um, is what makes good video? Or what makes a video good? Um, so I'm going to come around. I'm going to ask the two other groups for sure, group three and then group six, what makes uh, video good? And I'm going to find a couple other groups and ask them what they think make video good. Um, but take a couple minutes here and kind of discuss it with people to try and see what, if we can figure out what actually makes a video really good. All right, cool, let's bring it on back together. So we're going to start with group three. Who's the person that's going to be speaking on behalf for your group? Yes, sir. We got, hold on one second, still trying to figure out names. What's your name? Steven. Steven. Fantastic. What do you got for me, sir? Uh, we should like a plot. A plot? OK, cool. What about the plot? Has to be good. Okay, cool. So yeah, if you want, if you want a uh, a good a video, good or good video, you gotta have a good plot. Okay, we'll kind of discuss what that is and, and stuff a little bit later on. But yes, that is definitely part of it. And then group six, go for it. Yes, sir. Um, Kai. Okay. Good, and, and that's what we're going to be plugging into in the next couple of weeks. We're actually going to talk about how and why it's important for you to know who your audience is before you start making your video. Because if you know who your audience is, there's a better chance of getting your stuff to go viral, A, or B, to make sure that people actually like what it is that you're turning out. So yes, diff, definitely, very, very, very good on doing that. Anyone else want to chime in? What makes a video good? Go for it. Yes, what do you got, Andrew? Uh, can, you, can you define what you mean by quality? Okay, so d different in res uh, s different size resolution. So like 1080 versus 480. Um, so definition, clarity. Okay, good. <laughs> that is definitely part of it. Cool. Here's what video, or here's what makes a video quote good. Um, first thing that I want to note is that when we're talking about good video, we're actually not talking about the fact. Chase, if you need to go, you can go ahead and go. Go ahead and go. <clears throat> we're actually not talking. Ooh, that's a little bit loud there. <laughs> when we're talking about uh, of making a video good, we're not necessarily talking about whether or not you like it or not. Those are two completely different things. You can actually dislike a very good video, and you can actually like something that's really, really horrible, really, really bad. So I don't want to confuse those two. Your personal preferences have nothing to do with the objective, intrinsic abilities of the thing that we're discussing or talking about. 
Conversely, an individual can be, this is an, uh, literally an episode of The Office, an individual can be hot, but not beautiful. Those are two completely different, different identifiers if you're talking about a significant other and so on and so forth. Like, you can discuss and talk about whether or not there's beauty in the world, because if the answer is no, there's no such thing as, as beauty, okay, cool, then why do we discuss it becomes kind of a question. But the markers of, of what makes something beautiful, those don't actually change. And so when we start discussing and talking about good video versus bad video, I'm not saying whether or not I like it or you like it. I'm saying whether or not it hits all the markers that it needs to hit in order for something to be good, or whether or not it misses all those markers and it's bad. So when it comes to grading your videos in this particular class, it's not whether or not I like the content that you're putting together and how it looks up on screen. I'm looking at, did you hit the markers that you needed to hit in order to incorporate something good? Because you can have something in there that's really, really good, but be disliked by me. So I want to make sure you guys know that ahead of time as we're making our videos throughout the year. So here's what good video does. Good video properly incorporates every aspect of video together to ultimately uh, create a purpose and a message that is not easily forgotten. So we were talking about the, me Kai was talking about the message earlier and how it's important to get that message across to your intended audience. Message is very, very important. Okay, why? Because again, this technology can be used as either a weapon or a tool. Okay, they can be used either way. Again, I like to put it in the same category as knives, guns, and so on and so forth. They can be used as tools to get something done that you might need to get done. Or they can be used as, as weapons to create havoc and chaos. So it, it really just depends on how you utilize the thing. So let's take a look at something that's bad. What I like to do is I like to start taking a look at something that's bad first before we take a look at something that is good. So um, before we take a look at that, I want us to know, or I want you guys to know, we're looking at these nine things. We're going to be looking at the talent, camera, crew, scenery, color, lighting, sound, script, and plot. Okay, those nine things are the things that we're going to be touching on and trying to decipher if this video that I'm about to show you is either good or bad. Now I'm going to tell you right now, it is bad up front because again, I don't think you can know what good is unless you see what bad is. For example, I don't think you can understand why it's important that you live your life to the best of your ability until you see a dead person. Because if you don't know what death looks like, or if you don't have someone that's close to you, like a cat or a person or an individual die, you don't understand the value of what it is that you actually have. So, so having an uh, understanding of the bad part first helps lead to make things better. And I really think, by the way, if you're going through bad and tough times in your life, that's the reason why you go through bad and tough times. Because then you can really realize when something's good and do whatever you can to keep that around because you know that that's better than what it was that you've been through before. Okay, so let's take a look at something that's bad. Bad video. We're going to watch it for five minutes.
very long time ago, there was an island in the South China Sea. It was known as Phoenix Island. The capital of the island was a magnificent place called Golden City. The emperor of the city was aided by his three loyal generals. They were Che Chan, Ma Xiang Kung, and Pao Ting. They combined their talents to establish a new form of Kung Fu, Sun Chai. Even the most fearsome bandits were scared to cause trouble on Phoenix Island. The citizens lived their lives in peace. But one day, Master, now I have the dragon stick. You will soon rule Golden City. You'll be the new master of Phoenix Island. I know, right? Yeah, I'm saying. Now remember, I said it's bad video. I didn't say I didn't like it, right? <laughs> okay. So that that's the reason why I want to start off with bad video. You can enjoy bad video through and through. I love stuff like this. Kung Pao into the fist, man. Back when I was your guys' age, that was hilarious. Stay up until two in the morning, having uh, spend the night over at my buddy's house and stuff like that. We'd be out in the pool, the spa, put up on his big screen. Uh, or not big screen, but projection and stuff. Oh, it's hilarious. Sit back and just kind of like watch a comedy that was crazy stupid as we're just hanging out. Like, that was fun. But that doesn't make it a good video. <laughs> like if I go back and take a look at like these, these uh, nine things here, okay, these nine components, we can talk about them. The talent, I mean, it's great fighting talent, right? If you're really into Kung Fu, no, not even. Maybe for some people. Okay, the camera. Yeah, there's literally a time where if you're actually watching where it looks like he's on the horse, like using the whip and stuff, the camera bobs down and you can see that they're in the bed of a truck. Okay, there's actually a point when they're done towards the end of the, the credits and stuff where the camera just pans up and you see the sky and there's words written on the screen but you can't see them because the color matches, which by the way is one of the th next things, the color matches too closely to the color of the sky so you're like, what? This is what? But you, most of you didn't even realize that it said ass director at one point. Oh. Yeah, yeah, like, like if you paid close enough attention, you'd see that that stuff was off. It's like, what in the world has happened? The lighting, like, who knows what's going on? The sound is like really loud. It doesn't match up with the voices of the characters. Like, 
that's crazy, right? The script and the plot. I mean, it's a kung fu movie, so you know they're focusing on the fighting. The only reason why they have the script is to kind of push us to, to push the plot forward, so we kind of know we're going somewhere. We're just not watching two guys spar with kung fu, right? Because otherwise, you're just watching basically a weird MMA fight. Okay, at that point, so you can see how it is objectively bad. I love it. It's crazy. Now, what's even, what's even more crazy about this is that this film looked really bad, right? So we talk about the quality of it. Okay. This film has one point, or this video has almost 1.2 million views on YouTube. The like saber, I always call them like sabers because literally it looks like a lightsaber inverted if you did things right. Okay, the like saber is huge. More people like it and love it than hate it. Okay, females, this is definitely probably not your ballpark. You're like, what in the world is my teacher torturing me with today? Right, because typically that is not something that would appeal to a mass audience that is female. So, of course you're not going to like it, and then it's bad video on top of it, you're like, this is torture now at this point, right? Okay, but what's really interesting is that this is the official video for this film. AM Pop Films uploaded this in 2009. They actually have a rating on here for it, for what it is, and it's at, they actually are the copyright holder for this particular film that was produced back in the late 70s. So you're watching it as these people wanted you to see it. That's what's crazy out of all this, is this, no, this is what we wanted to do. This is what we wanted to put together. Enjoy it. Watch the fishing line, and it looks like there's a ring attached to it as the ring goes flying by on the fishing line, because you can't really do cool special effects, right? Bad video can be really, really bad. Conversely, good video can be really, really, really good. So I want us to take a look at a good video to, co just to compare the two, okay? This is from a film called The Social Network came out in 2010, a little bit later. Let's take a look at the difference between a good video and a bad video. They can, and I did it in Tell did the render call. I know, that's how we appreciate talks. it. As of yesterday evening, Zuckerberg said over 650 students had registered to use the Facebook.com. He said he anticipated that 900 students would have joined the site by this morning. Yeah, uh, Divya was just reading that 650 students signed up for it on the first day. God, if I was a drug dealer, I couldn't give free drugs to 650 people in one day. This guy doesn't have three friends to rub together the next fourth. Come on. All right. Yes, that's what we'll do, Mr. Hodgkins. We'll put all this together and we'll email it to you. Uh, well, you won't be able to go on the website yourself uh, because you don't have a Harvard. Um, you know what? It, it would just be easier for us to email it to you. I'm sure you're right. He's he's a good guy and he's very bright and I'm sure he didn't mean to do wow. what he did. All right. Thank you very much. And Dad. All right. Love you too. This is a good guy. We don't know that he's not a good guy. We know he stole our idea. We know he lied to our faces for a month and a half. No, he never lied to our faces. Okay, he never saw our faces. Fine. He lied to our email accounts, and he gave himself a 42-day head start because he knows what apparently you don't, which is that getting there first is everything. I'm a competitive racer, Div. I don't think you need to school me on the importance of getting there first. Thank you. All right. That was your father's lawyer. This is in-house counsel. He's going to look at all this, and if he thinks it's appropriate, he'll send a cease and desist letter. What's that going to do? What, do you want to hire an IP lawyer and sue him? No, I want to hire the Sopranos to beat the shit out of him with a hammer. We don't even have to do that. That's right. We can do that ourselves. I'm 6'5", 220, and there's two of me. I'm with well, this guy. Well, whatever. I'm saying let's calm down until we know what we're talking about. How much more information are you waiting for? We met with Mark three times. We exchanged 52 emails. We can prove that he looked at the code. And what is that on the bottom of the page? This is a Mark Zuckerberg production. Uh, on the home page? On every page. Shit, I need a second to let the classiness waft over me. Okay, look, we don't Cam, know that they wrote Zuckerberg said he hoped the privacy options would help restore his reputation following student outrage over facesmash.com. That's exactly what we said to him. He's giving us the finger in the crimson. Now, while we're waiting for Dad's lawyer to look this stuff over, we can at least get something going in the paper no. so people know what? that this is in dispute. We're not starting a knife fight in the crimson, and we're not suing anybody. Why not? I don't understand. I understand. Why not? He's going to say it's stupid. But who, me? Say it. Why not? Because we're gentlemen of Harvard. This is Harvard, where you don't plant stories and you don't sue people. You, you thought he was going to be the only one who thought that was stupid? During the time when you say you had this idea, did you know Tyler and Cameron came from a family of means? A family of means? Did you know their father was wealthy? I'm not sure why you're asking me that. It's not important. You'll be sure why I'm asking. It's not important to you. Sai. Did you know that they came from money? I had no idea whether they came from money or not. In one of your emails to Mr. Narendra, you referenced Howard Winklevoss's consulting firm, if you say so. 
Howard Winklevoss founded a firm whose assets are in the hundreds of millions. Mm -hmm. You also knew Tyler and Cameron were members of a Harvard final club called the Purcellian. They pointed that out. Excuse us for inviting you in. To the bike room. Please. So it's safe to say you were aware that my clients had money. Yes. Let me tell you why I'm asking. I'm wondering why, if you needed $1,000 for an internet venture, you didn't ask my clients for it. They had demonstrated an interest to you in that kind of thing. I went to my friend for the money because that's who I wanted to be partners with. Eduardo was the president of the Harvard Investors Association, and he was also my best friend. Your best friend is suing you for $600 million. I didn't know that. Tell me more. Eduardo, what happened after the initial launch? I'm sorry, Cy, would you mind addressing him as Mr. Saverin? Gretchen, they're best friends. Not anymore. Oh, we already went through this on the... Never mind. Mr. Saverin, what happened after the initial launch? It exploded. Everybody on campus was using it. Facebook me. It was a common expression at the two weeks. And, uh, Mark? And Mark was the biggest thing on the campus. It included 19 Nobel laureates, 15 Pulitzer Prize winners, two future Olympians, and a movie star. Well, who's the movie star? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay, same amount of time, slightly different story, right? Turn that down a little bit because that's up a little bit loud. But interesting to kind of compare the two. So now if we go back like what we were doing before and take a look at, let me just go and quit out of this. These nine components, we can talk about them. Talent, okay, talent, a little bit better acting, right, than, than what we saw before, right? Um, even though they're not doing kung fu, kung fu, really cool moves and stuff like that, you can still kind of get what they're doing. Camera, more stable, steady, has a precise meaning in the way that it's set up, okay, and the movement that it's using. The crew, could you tell how many people worked on this film? Like, it doesn't look like it was done in a backyard. There were probably thousands of people that worked on this particular film, okay. Scenery, you can tell that it looked like they were actually in Harvard or another place rather than just looking up at a sky and trying to figure out what color the writing is and be able to read it up against the sky. Same thing with color and lighting. It was a little bit darker, but it was meant to be darker on purpose because it's supposed to be happening at night. Plus, at this point in the story, the story is dark and grim. Okay. Sound, pretty good. Very subtle music in the background. Very good script, very good plot kind of pushing things forward. Okay. Now, what most of you guys probably didn't notice were the visual effects. Okay. And I want to see if you can see them this time through as you're watching one of the more important uh, scenes to, to ever exist on film. But the visual effects that happened this time through, or that happened before that you might have missed, is the fact that there is one guy playing two people. You saw how there were twins, six foot five, two twenty, and there's two of them. In real life, there's only one of those individuals. Army Hammer is one actor. He played both roles, but it made it look like he was playing both of them simultaneously upon screen. And it was so subtle, the visual effect between the two, that you didn't really necessarily even notice it. And even when you're watching them sit together in this next scene, you really won't even notice that it was shot at two different times using the same actor. Just composited in, one right over the top of each other to make it look like he was playing two different people. Okay? The next scene that I'm going to show you, I shouldn't have exited out of it. The next thing I'm going to show you is, is widely considered to be two of the best minutes of film done in the last century. Okay? The reason why it's two of the best minutes that have been done in the last century is because you actually legitimately feel a power shift happened. You actually can feel the story compel you to do something and you feel as if you're involved in part of the story. And I want to go back and kind of explain how that happens after we take a look at it. So I got to take a look and see where I'm supposed to start this. 4854. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at this. What are we doing about this? I went to a 3L at Student Legal Services, and he told me to write them back. And what did you say? Actually, pause this real quick right here. It's always great when you're trying to uh, set up how a video is, is viewed. And uh, subtitles are like forced to be on. Ugh, party foul. Take that off. There we go. All right. Here we go. And 
In January, I expressed my doubts about the site, where it stood with graphics, how much programming was left that I had not anticipated. The lack of hardware we had to deal with, site use, the lack of promotion that would go on to successfully launch the website. This was the first time you raised any of those concerns, right? I'd raised concerns before. Bullshit. Not to us. Gentlemen, I'm talking about at the meeting in January to which this letter is referring. Yeah. Let me rephrase this. You sent my client 16 emails. In the first 15, you didn't raise any concerns. Is that a question? In the 16th email, you raised concerns about the site's functionality. Were you leading them on for six weeks? No. Then why didn't you raise any of these concerns before? It's raining. I'm sorry? It just started raining. Mr. Zuckerberg, do I have your full attention? No. Do you think I deserve it? What? Do you think I deserve your full attention? I had to swear an oath before we began this deposition, and I don't want to perjure myself, so I have a legal obligation to say no. Okay, no. You don't think I deserve your attention? I think if your clients want to sit on my shoulders and call themselves tall, they have a right to give it a try, but there's no requirement that I enjoy sitting here listening to people lie. You have part of my attention. You have the minimum amount. The rest of my attention is back at the offices of Facebook, where my colleagues and I are doing things that no one in this room, including and especially your clients, are intellectually or creatively capable of doing. Did I adequately answer your condescending question? I have 12.45. We say that's lunch. Back at 2.30. Yeah, right? Dang, right? You can literally feel it. You, your body itself actually tensed up at this point. And that's what happens when you get a bunch of people that are really, really talented that know how to utilize film together to create something that is unmistakably important, okay? Now I'm gonna walk you through how this was actually done. I'm gonna pull, go back through and play it and talk about it as it's going on. So the first thing that you'll notice is how he's sitting forward and Mark is sitting back, okay? He's on the attack trying to corner him, trying to get him to say certain things and trying to basically show that he was wrong. He's even pointing at him and you can see he's sitting back like defeated. These guys, when they say the words bullshit, are standing up, shoulders tall, leaning forward, like almost on the attack as well. Okay. You'll see that there's, uh, um, as they're going back and forth, if you listen to the music, you'll hear piano. In the 16th email, you raise concerns about the site's Be really soft and sad. And then you'll hear a tonal shift. See how it shifts in the music? And you can kind of feel this turning and twisting and pulling. And now there's no music. It's because these two individuals are now going back and forth. So now you see he's sitting up straight, he's sitting up straight because there's a power struggle going on here between these two individuals. Okay? So he's not totally leaning back anymore. He's not also being aggressive and being on the attack. They're kind of jostling for power. And you'll see that when he wants to assert his dominance and power, he gets louder. Then he'll lean forward. The music gets really dark. And now all of a sudden he's on the attack. And now he's doing the pointing. These guys are nervous, leaning back. And then there's a stare down. To basically say, I'm more powerful than you, shut up, I know what I'm talking about. Then he does a literal mic drop, like, throws the pen down. And then when it goes back to leaning back. Okay. The music followed with the bodily motions as well as the camera as things were progressing. So combining all those things together and really utilizing the camera and film to do what you want to do is extremely important. Now I know what you're saying, right? This film right here, this thing had a lot more money than the other film did. So does money play a factor in whether or not you actually can, there we go, or not, uh, whether or not you can turn out a very good film? Is it money? Well, let's take a look because Wikipedia lists out all the expensive films, the most expensive films in history, and it, and it shows us which ones are the most expensive. We'll start down here. Number 10, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Okay. Anyone know how many Academy Awards it won? I think it was one. 
maybe one. Okay? Ninth most, most expensive film, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Okay, let me zoom this in a little bit so you can see this a little bit more. Okay. John Carter, number eight. Widely considered to be the film that lost Disney the most money in the last decade. Because it lost money for Disney. Seventh, Solo, a Star Wars story. Okay. Cost 275 million. By the way, it costs about anywhere between 17 to 20 million to run this entire school for the entire year. That's to pay for all the teachers' salaries, all the water, all the electricity, um, to pay for all the, excuse me, all the equipment that we have here, um, to pay for the food, everything else. 17 to 20 million. They're spending 270 million, 275 million dollars on one film for two hours. That could run this school for 13 years, 15 years. Basically, the entire time that we've been around here in Marietta, it took that much money for it to make Solo, a two hour film, two and a half hour film. That was good or bad, you can kind of decide. But there are some athletes that are getting paid that much money. Contracts over 10 years, 275 mil, 27 million a year. So one individual is getting paid more than it takes to run this entire community of 4,000 people. Okay. Justice League and Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End cost $300 million a piece. Avengers Affinity War costs $316 million. Avengers Endgame costs $356 million. And Avengers Age of Ultron costs $365 million. All those films together, $1 billion for just those three films. Literally could run this school for 50 plus years, almost 65 years with that amount of money. And they're spending it on three films to make them. That's not people paying to go see them. That's just to make them. Okay. But those aren't even the most expensive films of all time. The most expensive film of all time is Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, which was almost $400 million. Okay. A lot of money going there. And not one of those films in the top 10 has been nominated for Best Picture of the Year. Not one. <clears throat> They're all really cool. They have a lot of really cool stuff. You have to go down to Tangled before you get a nominee for Best Picture of the Year. And it's, even then, it was Best Animated. You actually have to scroll down even further. So it's not Star Wars Force Awakens, not Spider-Man 3, not Beauty and the Beast, not Harry Potter, not The Lion King, that's the new one, not, the trans not Transformers. You have to go down to Avatar, number 18, which cost $237 million a year before you find a film that was nominated for Best Picture of the Year. Didn't even win it, it was just nominated. The first winner of Best Picture of the Year, as I continue to go down here, is... Let's see here. Nope, not Maleficent, not that, not that. Jeez Louise. Wow, you have to go really far down to find it. Nope, nope. Titanic, 1997, $200 million, 41st most expensive film of all time. Okay, so money doesn't necessarily equate to better film, better message, better story. You can do cooler stuff with it. It gives you more time. It gives you a better chance, but it doesn't fully make it a good video. Same thing in life. If I were to go around and give you guys $2 million, you'd be like, dude, sweet, I am set. I don't have to worry about things for a while. Like giving people money doesn't actually fix things. Because if it fixed things or if it did make things better, you'd see a bunch more of these films being nominated for Best Picture of the Year. So me going around giving you $2 million isn't actually going to fix things. What would fix it is how you used it. It's to show you how to use money so that way you can learn to utilize the money that you got given, sure, that you were given, in order to make more money off of that money. Because $2 million isn't good enough, you want closer to 10. Can you use that two to make 10? And then can you use that 10 to make 100? And can you use that 100 to make a billion? And so on and so forth. Okay? In these guys' case, they weren't really telling stories that were the best, most amazing stories. They were telling stories that were visually appealing and that the smallest, I don't want to say dumbest, uh, but the simplest individual can go see. They weren't complex or complicated. Very, very simple, very, very straightforward. Okay, so money doesn't actually do it. Money doesn't actually sell it. Okay, what ends up selling it is story. Okay, if you want to take a look at these two films, these two films won Best Picture in 2005 and in 2010. Crash only had a budget of less than $10 million in order for it to be filmed. The King's Speech had a budget of less than $15 million and it only opened in four theaters. One in LA, one in New York, I think one in Chicago, and I think San Francisco was the other one. Only four theaters. That's it. And they were still able to get the best picture of the year. 
Ended up beating out Inception, actually, for Best Picture of the Year, if I remember correctly. Had the same amount of awards as Inception, but yeah. So <clears throat> money doesn't necessarily sell you on it. It's good story. You want to make sure that you have a good story, and if not uh, a good story, one of the best stories. Okay. Cool. Any questions at all from today? It's a lot we kind of covered. First day, we kind of covered where the history of, of film went. Okay. We also discussed and talked about the technology uh, of film and what it is. Now we're focusing more on, on what categorizes film and what makes good or bad film. And the, next, uh, and the next thing that we'll be discussing and talking about, if I remember correctly, I think we're talking about talent. So let me just double check here just to be sure. I have it coming up. Yeah, we're going to be talking about directors and talent. How can we start to pull good stuff out of individuals, even people with no experience, and make sure that gets shown up on screen? And not only that, how can we make sure that the story that we tell puts us on a path that will actually take us in the direction that we want it to go? Because we can change a lot with the stories that we tell, and we can make a lot of money off the stories that we tell if we know how to target our particular audience and utilize the talents that we have.